oh, what a great shutter. I don't know about putting the back on, it's a little bit awkward. It's not actually the original back for this camera. I don't know if that makes any difference. Uh, it just seems to require a little bit of um, wiggling around. I don't think that's right. I think it's... Oh, it looks right. Ah, here you go. Yeah, it's got to go in the... Yeah. When I got this camera, the back was broken. These, these were broken. It's probably how it got broken by somebody doing what I just did with it. So don't force it. It's always got to be fitting into there. But you'll see that this is the original back that came. And I, I did actually manage to fix it a little bit. It actually now sort of works. But when I bought the camera, the ca these cameras can be quite expensive and I picked this up for next to nothing because it had a broken back and the guy said that there was a problem with the back and so not, nobody wanted it so I picked it up very cheaply and I looked on eBay at the same time and you'll find this if you if you if there's something wrong with the camera and the piece that fixes it is coming up about the same time normally just afterwards and I, I did notice that there was a back the back that I bought for that was coming up for a very small amount of money and so as soon as I bought the camera I bought the back and so the two objects came together really and, and I, I, I didn't know whether I could fix it or not but I knew that I needed the back and it, I, it was hard to find the back at the right price and um, you know I didn't want to pay more than about £10 for the back and so I managed to find a good back for it and so I ended up getting a, a very nice Contax camera for very little money and everything's working on it including the shutter which can be problematic apparently they're very very difficult to repair if you do have a problem with them so I'll just stop a moment because I need to check the videos okay Yeah, I felt it was a little bit tight in the frame. And so, what I want to talk about today is the origins of the Pentacon company in Zeiss Icon and the Contax, and how they developed the Contax after World War II into a single lens reflex camera, the first single lens reflex camera with a penta prism. And that they used the um, technical expertise of the KW people to do this because the KW people had the Practina and the Practica um, and the Exacta people, they were all, all working in the same area and so what they wanted to do after the war was produce a camera based on the contacts and the contact body and the contact shutter but the problem they had was with the contact shutter being a vertical focal plane shutter the mechanism was too tall and so the design problem of trying to put in the pentaprism into that camera the mechanism for the shutter was in the way of where the light needed to pass through to the eyepiece. And so what, they struggled with it for some time and eventually they came up with the using the cloth focal plane shutter that had been developed by um, camera work leader settlers, KW. I'll put their logo up and on, on one of their cameras. Now, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm rendering yesterday's video, which I finished this morning. And this discussed the various Practica models that you might want to buy and collect in order to acquire lenses for your digital single lens reflex or digital 
um, camera. And so I cover a little bit of a kind of an overview of Practica there. And what I want to do in this video is go over its history from the first models produced after the war to the last model, which um, was in the 1990s. The nicest one, I think, is the Yenna Flex. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to work our way through the various history, if you like, of Practica. Now the first Practica was called the Practiflex. And this was made between 1939 and 1949. And it had a cloth focal plane shutter which is inherited, I suppose, from the exacto. <clears throat> I don't know. And which comes originally from the Leica. <clears throat> now, the Practive Flex was a simple camera. It was a single lens reflex without a pendant prism. You look down into it. It looked a bit similar to this. And there was a eyepiece and focusing mechanism you could focus through the lens and then you'd use a waist level like this I suppose and it's very awkward to use but it was good because you could see the actual image area of your lens and so you could use interchangeable lenses and it started off this is a th focal plane shutter, a cloth focal plane shutter, the same shutter really. Very nice shutter indeed. You can hear the slow speed action. Okay, and the lenses that it took, this is a Carl Zeiss Yenna lens. Uh, also, the other main lens manufacturer there was Mayer Optic Gourmets. They were all around the same area of Dresden. Okay, so after the Practina came the Pentacom. This camera here, which started life as a Contax S. And became the Contax D, and the Contax F, Pentagon D, the Pentagon F. These were names which were forced upon the company. The company was a Contax company, and the whole operation was one company under Zeiss Icon at this time in East Germany. Zeiss Icon was really an East German company, and the West people in the West formed a competitive company, created something from nothing and called it Zeiss Icon and fought court battles against the East Germans to steal the name. So they stole the name and forced the uh, East Germans either out of the international market because they controlled the American market, the British market, the main markets in the world, Japan, Japanese market after the war, they controlled that as well. And so if the East Germans wanted to sell their cameras outside East Germany, which they had to to make any money out of it, they needed to call it something else. So they called it the Pentacon, and in the end, the Pentacon became the name of the company. So that's how Pentacon came about. It was a con, if you like, by the Western globalists to get rid of the East German camera industry. They didn't want to compete against it honestly, and so they had to resort to these subterfuge of fake court battles and we've seen this repeated over and over really and how fake judges are appointed into fake because their political positions into fake political positions and so fake laws are passed and this was a fake law to actually say the germans to stop the germans from selling their very fine context camera which was made in East Germany in Dresden, always made in Dresden and always was a Dresden object. 
And so that's how the context became the Pentacon. And the Pentacon is a genuine article. So if anybody's collected these cameras, this camera is worth much, much more than anything with context written on it. Because context is just the bad stuff. And the good stuff was Pentacon because they were the real makers of the camera. Okay. So I don't have a context in my collection. Wouldn't have a context in my collection. I would throw out any context that I had and I would only have uh, Pentacons and Kiev cameras in my collection because these are the real original cameras that come ex Dresden. that I talked about uh, this camera, the Practina camera, as the development, if you like, of the Practica. And this was made just before the context S. And so this is a contemporary with the context S. It was made, I think, in the 1950s mainly. Both cameras were made. And the context S was, um, had a fixed pentaprism and this one had the uh, removable pentaprism. It was a system, proper system camera. And so last time I showed this camera, I couldn't find the button. I remember there's a button here. You have to undo the button at the bottom there, remarkably. And then the viewfinder is removed. removed. And you can put your various attachments, microscope attachments, special finders, and, and so on or a, a single lens reflex. It came with a single lens reflex pentaprism. I don't have one of those. I can't really show you one of those because I mainly got the camera to show the uh, pra practiflex. Yeah, it's so similar. A little easy to get back for some reason. Oh bit dry it needs a little bit of lubrication on there just to make it go back a little bit better and then to stop it sort of falling off you can lock the lens now it's interesting because the first cameras that came out like this they they were very mechanical the, they didn't have um, proper uh, opening and closing mirrors and everything like this and this camera had the first return mirror so um, automatic uh, autom uh, uh, stop down, automatic stop down, and so what happens is there's a special lever here on the lens which opens the aperture up and then locks it into position. And then when you press the shutter button, it will. I'll, I'll set the aperture down a bit so you can you can see. You can preset the aperture to f8, for example, and then when you fire it off. You should see it stop down. I hope you saw that. I'll do it again. You can preset the aperture. F16. And oh, you've got to cock this uh, if you want to see through the lens. If you don't want to see through the lens, you don't have to cock it. So, you know, um, it's a very uh, advanced camera, this. It's also got an, a normal viewfinder, a sports viewfinder built into it as well. So if you wanted to follow the sports action, this, this always is, um, is open all the time. If you're looking through the pentaprism, then you'd cock this shutter over here to open the aperture up so you could see it at, at full focus and everything. And then when you made the shot, the aperture would shut down. Now, the mirror doesn't come up straight away. The mirror actually only comes up when you wind the shutter that brings the mirror up. Okay, so that's a pre Practina and it also had a, 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 a one of the first cameras to have, probably the first camera to have a motor drive. There was a motor drive assembly that went on the back here, it was all clockwork and this would then 
wind and film on automatically you know for multiple shots and it would take the back is removable and um, it takes a it can take a big bolt film back and you know it was a proper system camera and probably the best camera that was made in the day and again these were very expensive cameras it's remarkable you can buy them so cheaply nowadays i would say they're a very very great um, object to have in one's collection okay so that's a practina and the next development after these two cameras was the practica 4 we'll go into that now Tika 4 is a remarkable camera really because it set the pattern for the cameras that followed it. The Asahi Pentax is basically a copy of this camera and what happened was the, the East Germans were quite happy to show people around their factories. They used to give tours and everything of their camera building factories and the Japanese used to come in and visit them and have a look at what they were doing and they talk about their latest innovations and developments and so on and so it's not surprising that the Japanese were able to if you like develop their camera industry and if the East Germans had been allowed to develop their industry in the same way that the Japanese were and had been encouraged by the rest of the world there would have been no problem East German cameras German cameras would have developed the same as Japanese cameras did. It's just that with all the court cases and all the other stuff and the problems, you know, you can imagine they create some marketing materials and go and print them and do all the artwork and get the marketing campaign ready. And then they change the name of the camera and, you know, they have to redo all the bits and pieces and redo, grind out the, the name and put another name on. Can you imagine all the, the difficulties this would cause? It would cause years and years of uh, the, the wasted time spent that would have been better spent on camera development and so this is how the Japanese got the um, upper hand really on the Germans because of what the West Germans and the globalists did to destroy the East German camera industry in the end they just destroyed the whole German camera industry that's basically what happened so the Practica 4 is basically very similar to a Practina and except the Practina has a more advanced shutter control. This has the, the wheel that goes round and round in the shutter. And so it's a fairly primitive kind of camera compared to the Practina. Practina is a much more advanced camera. But it did have well, the first lever wind, this on the bottom of the thing, was the first of that type of idea. And it was only shortly after that that people put the lever wind onto the top of the camera. It's arguable which way is the best. So the Practica 4 is a lovely camera and you can pick up these for about £50 if you're lucky, I suppose. They're a lovely camera. Okay, so they sold these for some years. I'll just check the date on that. Okay, so the Practica 4 1959 and so you had 1939 to 49 was the practiflex 1949 the practica and the practica fx and that would evolve into the practina 1952 the practina came out 1956 the pentacon had its name on it there's a pentacon 959 the practica 4 so you can get an idea of how that worked now from 1959 
until 1964. This was the camera of the day and in 1964 the Practica Nova came out. So we'll have a look at that next. Well, you might have heard that funny little bell go off on the video and that was a message coming in saying that it's the 200th year anniversary to the day today not 200, 100 years ago that they opened, discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun in Egypt and so uh, I suppose it's a significant day, 100 year anniversary of that so here we are in the discovering the tomb of the GDR camera saga. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the next body that came along. And that one is the Practica Nova. Or the Super TL is it's kind of evolution if you like. So it started off with with the shutter dial that went round and round and ended up with a fancy single shutter dial. <clears throat> so this is the body that probably lasted the whole of the 60s really and it was a kind of period in time when they were moving to from um, hand-built cameras into a kind of a mass production <clears throat> And they built a machine, a circular machine, I'll put a picture up of this, where the body, the actual the die cast block of a body that it's, all the stuff attaches to, this was um, a very difficult thing to make because it's got a lot of drillings and finishing off holes in special places. Many operations have to be made to this die cast body. To be able to take all the other pieces that go on it and so they built this circular machine that is special in um, this part of the world it's all to do with three-dimensional uh, the mind working in three dimensions so you can imagine how difficult it might be to conceive of and make this machine that automatically performs all these operations on the camera bodies and so <clears throat> that was probably started on this body here and eventually it moved from this this was a for ten years they pretty much ran with this body, and then they produced this more squared off version, and and it seems when you when you go from the one to the other it seems like there's a kind of a that this is a higher quality than this, and I feel that probably the top may well be plastic I don't know. It's hard to tell. They started to introduce plastic parts and also the covering around here. This is more like a like of a plastic material. Although it's an interesting styling thing, I do feel that it kind of lowered the quality. And they had to because the prices that they were getting for these things was next to nothing. So they had to produce them for a certain price, if you like. And you can see there was a button here which... Um, looks like it's metal but it's got plastic inside it maybe and now we have a complete what looks like a complete plastic part here for the depth of field preview and the, to operate the meter so we're starting to get a little bit low cost but in actual fact the shutter is very good <clears throat> now that's the main difference between these two during the period of the 60s they developed the metal focal plane shutter and um, that shutter was then implemented in this new body, if you like, the square shaped body of the 1970s. <clears throat> so all the bodies with all the cameras with this particular shape body are pretty much part of the same series. And then the next one after this was a more um, a, a higher top on it and a smaller body. And I'll show you the one I've got of that. <clears throat> and that is the Yeniflex. Now, 
you'll see that the Enerflex it has contacts over here, electrical contacts over here, which started off with this model here, the Practica LLC. This was the first model in the world to have an electronic contact. You can see these big three big contacts here that allowed a screw mount lens to electronically connect to the camera body. That was the first in the world. So they were right at the forefront of innovation. And I did feel that this black body was quite a, a nice style. Well, this particular body doesn't actually work that well. Um, and so it's just really, I only got it just so I could show you what the black body looks like and what this, how this was developed. And so if you compare these two bodies, there's quite a difference in size to the two bodies. And and the weight is about the same. But this one feels much more solid and nicer in the hand. And so if you wanted a camera to use for film, to actually a, a working camera that you wanted to shoot film on, I recommend getting one of these because these are just great cameras for great film cameras. And um, these also are okay too. So neither or whatever. But your chances are of getting a working one of these working well is much higher than getting a good working one of these. These ones I, I think had the mechanic. The, the, the shutter became completely electronic. You see, it's electronic and. Um, to be able to control the curtains and stuff and it's much more accurate and probably as long as the battery doesn't run out it's probably more reliable in the end than, um, than this approach <clears throat> and so this is the evolution if you like of the Practica I'll give you a bit of a closer view of that From the contacts, this is the latest one, going back through time, and sorry, we're going back through time, here we go, back through time, these ones here, and then through to here, and all coming out of the Practina, if you like, and the contacts S and Pentacon models, which I've now put back in the cupboard in its rightful place, right at the top, next to the cup of Elizabeth, the wonderful Pentacon F, the end of the journey, if you like, to the single lens reflex, and the one that they copied, the Nikon F copied, the Miranda, the Miranda copied it, they all copied it, and so the origin is the Pentaprism, Carl Zeiss designed, in Jena, and everything else is a copy of that design. <laughs>